Federal Drive is presented by GEHA, Government Employees Health Association, proudly providing health and dental benefits to federal employees and their families. Visit GEHA.com. Thousands of federal employees traipse to and from it every day, even in the age of telework. Some parts of it look like a major world capital. Some like Tony Suburbs and some like shanty towns. That's our Washington, D.C. Portions of it have been shaped for a century by the National Capital Planning Commission. Joining me for a centennial retrospective, the commission's executive director, Marcel Acosta. Mr. Acosta, good to have you back. Thank you very much, Tom. And it's 100 years of the commission, huh? Yes, it is. Uh, the commission was created by Congress in 1924. We were originally a parks planning agency, so we acquired many of the parkways, such as George Washington Parkway, that makes these makes the nation's capital so wonderful, the Fort Circle Park system. But two years later, the Congress added planning responsibilities to the National Capital Planning Commission, as we know it today. And basically, we had the oversight over the development of the region, uh, planning for the region, especially when it comes to the federal city and, and federal portions of Washington, D.C. Right. I think people sometimes mistake the commission for only having purview over, say, you know, the Pennsylvania Avenue monumental corridor area. But actually, your reach is to all corners of D.C., Yes, our jurisdiction also includes the counties that are next to Washington, D.C., and there are many important federal installations there, such as the National Institutes of Health that are important to our nation. So uh, we cover that, the Pentagon, uh, military bases. So it's not just about the Monumental Corps and the Mall, but it's all these important things that makes our uh, country's government work well. Sure, yeah, the Pentagon would have still been in D.C. until 1848, I think it was. The Virginia part was ceded back to Virginia. That is right. I never understood that one. I like the square idea. But, I mean, what are the challenges in this day and age of urban planning in a city that's it's diverse in terms of the types of people, but it's also a use-diverse type of city because there is this big federal footprint, but there's also neighborhoods. Yes, we work very closely with our local partners, uh, including the District of Columbia government, our local jurisdictions, the private sector. And, you know, we kind of look at this as this is one city, one region at the end of the day. And so to the extent that the federal government uh, contributes to that is a hugely important part of our mission. But we also look at it in terms of how can it not only support the operational needs of the federal government, the symbolic value of Washington, D.C. as the nation's capital, but how can we make it work for the people who live here, who work here on a daily basis? So to that extent, we plan very closely with efforts such as everything you see around the Anacostia waterfront, for example, the new development that's going on there. But there's also so the Department of Transportation headquarters, the Navy Yard is still there. But, you know, how we blend those things in a place that is wonderful for the citizens of this region, but also for people who come and visit it and for the workers who, who have to come there every day, I think is something that we work on with our local partners in order to ensure that these things are planned well, but also are wonderful when they're completed. And like so many cities, you know, there's always this tension for people that want pedestrian and bicycle access. Tourists come in, especially in D.C., with huge buses. And over the years, the city government has changed the way the traffic lanes disappear, bike lanes start to appear. What's the traffic and traffic planning outlook looking like? Well, we're looking at kind of a balanced transportation network for this region. I mean, of course, you know, people will drive to places, but we want to provide more opportunities for other types of modes of transportation, including walking, bicycling, taking transit is an important one, especially for the federal workforce in order to get to work. The effort has really been how can we maximize and optimize our transportation resources, the roads, the sidewalks, and how to just allow people to make a choice to get to where they want to go in the most convenient way possible for them. So I think that's been kind of the most recent practice in terms of how we move people around. It's not just about moving cars. It's about how do we move people. And I think that's really kind of been the focus of all the transportation planning in this region. Right. I guess it's a sort of hybrid for most people. They're glad to take public transit into the city, Mm -hmm. but you have to get to the public transit. And usually that means a car. It's a car, but a lot of people walk. They walk to their bus stops. They walk to their metro stations. And they may take a bus to the metro rail station. So, again, you know, it's a network and people move in different ways 
along their trips. So that's kind of what we look at with respect to transportation and how people move throughout this region. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I've lived in my house in Montgomery County for 32 years. And this year, I discovered that the bus that runs outside of my neighborhood, which is about a five-minute walk to the mouth of the neighborhood, the bus picks me up there and drops me off across the street from this studio that we're talking in. I should do that instead of drive every day. But, you know, people have habits, I guess, and it's hard to hard to give it up. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, part of it is how do we communicate this very complex network and, and transportation modes that we offer. But it really is kind of, we want to allow all that to occur. We are speaking with Marcel Acosta, Executive Director of the National Capital Planning Commission. And you mentioned you work closely with the county governments, the D.C. city government, and so on. Decision-making is difficult when it's matrixed. How do decisions get made among the commission, the county commissions? and so on. Well, our commission is actually an interesting uh, mix of both federal stakeholders, but the mayor has appointees to our commissions. We have representatives from Virginia and Maryland on our commission. So really, it's through those conversations as they review plans or review projects that hopefully they come to consensus as to what the best course of action is. So by its constitution as a board, we have all the stakeholders that you need there in order to make good decisions. So I think that really helps us in terms of looking out for, you know, if we have a federal development that's occurring, how will it impact the surrounding neighborhoods? We also have public meetings where the public's able to testify and kind of bring forward any comments or concerns that they might have with respect to that project. So it is kind of a very open process, and I really think that helps us. And if you look at the evolution of the government, I mean, we're still talking about a possible FBI headquarters that would be in Prince George's County. That's one of one of the counties you're involved with. And then, as you mentioned, NIH is in Bethesda. So is Walter Reed. And you've got the NIST that's in Gaithersburg. And on and on it goes, the, uh, the Mark Center in Northern Virginia and the Pentagon. Increasingly, in recent decades, it's been, become a suburb-to-suburb ringing situation that may not have a D.C.-centric view. How has that affected the way the commission looks at things? Well, I think, again, uh, we're a regional commission at the end of the day. And, you know, obviously the monumental core and the heart of downtown is always going to be a very important aspect of our work because not only is it a home for federal workers and federal agencies, but also it's, you know, what people come to visit when they come to D.C. And I think the nation and our citizens take a great deal of pride in terms of how that looks and how that's maintained and how that's planned. And so that's always going to be a focus of our commission's work. As you said, uh, there are a lot of regional developments that are going on. A lot of it is they're there because they need the land for laboratories, for instance, or they need security for the missions that they have to accomplish within that workplace. So, you know, we have seen over time many more. Some of these agencies move out to different counties near D.C. And so, again, we work very closely with the county governments in terms of things like how do we access the facility from our roadway network? What are some of the environmental issues that may affect neighboring property? as well as the development itself. So we do work very closely with the local jurisdiction in terms of how to plan that facility properly in order to both minimize its impact on that community, but also make it a good neighbor at the end of the day. Sure. Yeah, the sad part is that, you know, when places like DHS, you know, end up in what used to be a fairly open area, it becomes really, you could call it Fort DHS, you know, for the way for the public access to, you know, Homeland Security. Likely when the FBI, you know, ends up somewhere, it's going to be Fort FBI, which is just, I guess, commentary on the times. And meanwhile, to celebrate your own centennial, the commission has a pretty good exhibit going on. Yes, we have an exhibit about 100 years of planning, our federal planning, in uh, the nation's capital. Uh, basically, it tells a series of stories in terms of uh, Washington, D.C. being a planned city from its inception in 1791, but also the 100 years of the commission's activities in this region. We had talked a little bit about the park system that the commission planned very early on and how it got to the point where it is one of the most admired and most heavily used park systems. 
systems in the entire country. That's a legacy of the commission, but also the stories behind it in terms of how it impacted the neighborhoods. To some extent, some people were displaced from these neighborhoods. So the the story is, I believe, very balanced in terms of what it represents. And we've talked a little bit about transportation. During the mid-century, of the uh, mid-20th century, the commission and, and our regional partners had a big discussion about how do we move people around this region. And that's really when a lot of these stories and the impacts of highways community actually happened. So the centennial presentation really tells that story, but how it ended up, how we ended up with a metro system at the end of the day. So I think people who want to understand the city,